Hi guys, and welcome to a video about Gaussian mixture model fitted using the EM algorithm. I already covered the EM algorithm in a previous video, so you should check it out. And I already gave an example of binomial mixture model. Uh, in this video, I'm going to cover Gaussian mixture model. There's a lot of videos about it, but I decided I also want one. Um, and maybe you can get extra insight from my video, who knows. So the Gaussian mixture model will start with the simple case of one dimension. Uh, and that we only have two clusters. So remember that um, we assume we have some latent variable uh, that decides which cluster we belong to. And given that we know which cluster we belong to, we assume that our data, given that cluster, distributes normal with a mean that corresponds to that cluster and a variance that corresponds to that cluster. So we have a few unknown parameters. We have the different means. In this case, we have two clusters, so two means, two standard deviation, and we have the probabilities of being in each cluster. Uh, here, since we only have two clusters, then we only have the probability of being in one cluster, and this already determines the complement probability, which is just one minus p. So in EM, what we want is to calculate this quantity over here, which we denote by q. It's the expectation with regards to z given x and all the previous parameters that we already know of the log uh, joint of x and z. So for a single observation, the joint can be decomposed into these two parts, uh, the conditional times the marginal, maybe. And um, this is just equal to this thing over here. Uh, this is the distribution given that we are in the uh, first cluster times the probability of that, or in one of the clusters times the probability of that, in the other cluster times the probability of that. And this is the corresponding um, latent variable. So remember, we don't really know the z, but if we knew it, then if z was one, this would be the term added to the likelihood. This would be our PDF. Uh, and if z was zero, this is what we would add to the likelihood. Okay, so this is this expression. We need to take the expectation of the log of this. So the log of the product turns into the sum of the logs. Um, the exponent term goes in the front. Uh, the expectation is just with regards to z, so only the z's get the expectation. Everything else doesn't. And to move from one single observation to an IID observation, just take the sum over all of this. Okay, in the E step, we need to calculate the E of ZI given everything that we knew before. So the E of ZI, the ZIs are just Bernoulli random variables. So it's just equals to the probability of the ZI equal to one. And this is given the, the single XI that we already know. So for each XI, we are looking, for each XI, we are looking what is the expectation of the ZI uh, given that we know this XI and also all the parameters from the previous step. Using base rule, we can uh, write it as like this. And this is simply our p. So I can write it as p, and this is just 1 minus p in our case. The m step involves taking the derivative of the q. So once we have our e z i's, we can use it and plug them here. And then we can take the derivative of this with regards to the different parameters. So for example, with regards to mu1, uh, we will get this thing over here, right? Uh, with mu1, this will here and the derivative of this is just this and the sum stays the same if we equate it to zero we get that mu one is equal to this thing over here so we see we get sort of a weighted average well not sort of exactly a weighted average uh, where each xi is weighted by the probability of it being in a certain class so we take each xi we weighted by the probability of it being in the first class and then uh we take the average of that. And this will be our new mean, okay? Similarly, for mu zero, we'll get this. For the sigmas, uh, if we do it with sigma z one here, then e z i here, it will become minus one over uh, sigma one. And if we take the derivative of this with regard to sigma one, we will just get this expression. Again, if we equate to zero and move terms, we get that the variance estimator is this expression over here, which is again a weighted sum. So we are the expectation, the variance is the expectation of this thing, right? So it's an average over this thing. But here we don't take the actual average, we take the weighted average 
given what we think is the probability of each x belonging in a certain cluster. Okay, um, and similarly for sigma zero. For, for the p, we take the derivative with regards to p, we equate it to zero, and we get that it's just the average of all the um, all the pro all the probabilities of being in cluster one. Okay, so we take all the probability of being in cluster one, and we take divided by n. Okay, so let's switch into R. Okay, and these are just some libraries that we need for uh, KDE for the multivariate normal for categorical and Dirichlet distribution for plotting and if we want a square root of a matrix. Um, yeah, so let's suppose we set P to be 0, 3 and uh, we create our data and we have mu 1 that is it from 2 and uh, the sigma 1 is square root of 2, so the variance is 2. And the second cluster has a mean of minus two and a variance of one, and we create our data. And this is how we generate the data. In reality, what you get is just the axis. You don't see the z, you don't know the mu's, you don't know the sigmas. Okay, and this is how it would look. If we want to do a KDE plot, it would look like this. In the E step, I just coded exactly what I've showed you before. Remember that in the E, we had that it. it's the normal uh, PDF times P and uh, the normal PDF times one minus P and the expectation of each I is just A divided by A plus B. Um, this was the numerator and this is the denominator uh, in the der derivation that I made. Okay, so this is the E step. In the M step, we just code exactly uh, what I mentioned before. Oh, and I should mention that here, uh, I'm assuming the PR knowns, th that the sigmas and Ps are knowns. I'm only trying to estimate the mu's, okay, in the first step. And so the M step only takes the derivative with regards to um, the mu's. So this is the derivative of the, with regards to the first uh, mu, and this is the derivative with regards to the second mu, again, a weighted average. And in the EM's algorithm, I just do the E and then do the M, and then keep updating my thetas until some tolerance is set, okay? Until they don't change so much. You can also do it until the log likelihood doesn't change so much. Okay, let's start with some initial values of theta zero. So theta zero is starting with uh, one and minus one. Remember that the true thetas are minus two and two. Okay, and then we run the EM algorithm and notice that I gave it a maximum iteration of 50, it stops after 22, and it finds something very close to two and something very close to minus two. Okay, and we could have also done this for the entire thing, for the p's, the mu's, and the sigma's. Um, the E step doesn't change so much. We just have to um, extract from the uh, parameters that we give it the sigma's and the p also. Okay, so this will be our new E step. And in the M step, we also have to, um, yeah, calculate the the derivatives with regards to the sigmas and also to p. So this is the derivative with regards to mu zero. This is with regards to mu to sigma zero. This is to mu one, this is to sigma one, and this is for p. Okay, and then we run again the EM algorithm. This time we have to give it a new value of theta zero. I just chose it uh, by myself. So I gave it the first mean is zero. Um, the first variance is half. The first the second mean is zero, the second uh, standard deviation is three, and the p is 0 0.7, just some random values I chose. And it will try to find the true values. So we run the EM algorithm. This time you see it reached all the way to 50. Let's raise the maximum iteration to 200 in this case. Okay, and we can see that after 119, it stops. And it gives us minus two and a variance of almost one, um, two and a variance of almost two, right? Because remember that the two uh, had a variance of two, okay? And it gives us back the variance, not the standard deviation. And the P that is very close to 0 0.3, P of 0 0.29, okay? So we can see that it works. Now let's move to the general case. So in the general case, we will have k uh, components, not just two, and we don't have to 
to have the, that the data is just one dimensional, the data can be multi dimensional. So the Z won't be just uh, Bernoulli, it will be a categorical distribution, okay? And we will encode it as a one hot factor. So uh, if we get this, then it means that uh, we are in the first component. If we get this, it means that we are in the last component. Given that we know in which cluster we belong, X distributes multivariate normal with a vector of means and a covariance matrix, okay? And each of the individual Z case are either zero or one. Um, so again, we, we write the joint uh, given the thetas, and we can write it like this. This is the PDF of, um, of multivariate normal, and we multiply it by the probability of being in a certain category, and we take this to the power of ZK, where again, we don't really know the ZKs. Uh, if we knew them, if we knew that the ZK was uh, zero, then we would just... Um, I'm sorry, if we knew that the Z1 uh, one is one, then we knew that we are in the first cluster and we would use the PDF of the first cluster. Okay, the Q is just taking, uh, turns out to be this sum. Um, and for N observation, we just take the sum over the different I. Notice that we have a sum over the clusters, the K, and a sum over the observation I. The E step doesn't change so much. The expectation of z i k is equal just to the probability of z i equal to k, and again we're doing this for each observation. We we are given an observation and we are thinking what is the probability of it being in the k cluster, and using Bayes' rule we can again get to this thing over here. So notice now instead of having uh, just two uh, parts in this sum, we can have uh, k. Uh, sums here. So we sum over all the K sums, over all the K clusters. In the M step, the only thing that changes is that we get exactly the same thing, only now the sigma uh, won't be a number, it won't be a scalar, it will be a matrix. The X's will be vectors and the mu's will be vectors. Uh, but if we solve them, we get exactly the same. We get a weighted average of the vectors. Okay. For the variance, we have to use some uh, rules of differentiating with regards to a matrix. So if I have X T A X and I want to take the derivative of it with regards to a matrix A, it's just equal to X X transpose. If I want the derivative of the determinant of a matrix with regards to the matrix, it's just equal to this thing. And since uh, in the end we will have this thing, maybe we already take the derivative with regards to the inverse of the matrix. So this is the term that we want to take the derivative of. Let's take it with regards to this. This is our A. This is our X, A, X, and this is the determinant of A. And so if we use the rules, we just get um, these expression over here, uh, which can be, uh, then we change size and we, um, here is this and this cancels. We just basically want the sigma K. So the sigma K, is equal to this thing. We can also write it as this thing over here. It's basically um, a matrix, right? The xi's uh, can be written as a matrix. The mu can be expanded. So this is an n uh, times um, p matrix if our dimension is p. And this is a p by one vector. If you can either broadcast it to all the different um, uh, rows, or you can just expand it to have exactly the same um, number of rows. In any case, we have n times p, transpose p times n. This is an n by n uh, weights matrix. And this is, again, the same thing. And we normalize it here. Yeah, so uh, we can, the, the weight matrix is just a diagonal matrix with the, again, the probability of each xi belonging to some cluster. And if we absorb this into W, basically normalize the weights, then uh, we get this thing over here. For the fees, uh, remember we have the constraint that the sum of the fees equal to one. The fees are the probability of Z to be in each cluster. It was the P before. Okay, so we can use a constraint optimization with a Lagrangian. Uh, it's just adding this term 
to um, the previous term that we had, yeah, to this. And if we take the derivative with regards to a certain phi k, uh, we will get this, and phi k will be equal to this. But using the constraint that the sum of phi k is equal to one, we can write it as this thing over here and equate it to one. If we change between the lambda and one, we get this. If we change between the sums, we get this. But the sum here has to sum up to one. Okay, because, well, it's the probability of the ith observation being in the first cluster plus being in the second cluster plus being in the k cluster. But the ith observation has to be in some cluster. So it has to be one. And if we sum over i, we get n. And so, long story short, the phi k's are exactly like the p before and they don't change at all. Let's, let's switch into r. So suppose we have three clusters. I'm drawing the probabilities of the fees randomly from a Dirichlet distribution, which just makes sure that the sum of the fees sum up to one. Um, suppose I decide um, how far the mu's are apart, and and I give sigmas that are quite um, close. They are both kind of uh, an identity matrix. Um, Okay, we sample the latent variables from a categorical distribution, giving the fees, the probabilities of being in each category. And then we create our data. Let's plot it. This is how our data looks like. And the code here uh, took inspiration from this GitHub code. Um, maybe just made a little bit of adjustment. I think there was a small error, uh, but you should check it out. Um, so for the E, what I do is I give it a vector of theta, and the theta contains the phi's, contains the mu's, and contains the sigmas. And with that vector, I calculate um, basically the numerator for each one. And I, I do it for each uh, cluster. And then I just take the numerator. I will have a vector, and I will just take the each element, and I divide it by the denominator, which is the sum over all the elements in the vector. Okay, and in M, what I do for the fees, I just take the, the means, right? The fees were just the means of the E's uh, for each cluster. So I take the column means. Uh, for the mu's and the sigmas, what I do, this just calculates the covariance matrix in the end, right? It calculates the X minus mu transpose uh, w tilde x minus mu. And this just extracts the mu's. And the way this calculates the mu's is exactly like uh, we analytically calculated the mu's. And so this just extracts the mu's and this extracts the uh, covariance. And then it just returns it. And this does it for each one of the case. Okay, so this was the do m. Uh, here we will calculate the log likelihood just so that we, instead of, we have a lot of parameters here, so I don't want to check the norm of the entire parameters. Let's just check the log likelihood. And if it doesn't change so much, we stop. And so the EM algorithm does the E for some thetas, then it does the M for some E and does it iteratively. It calculates the difference in the log likelihood. If it doesn't change so much, it stops. Okay, let's give it some uh, initial value. Let's give it, uh, I set a seed here. I will explain why in shortly. Uh, so this will give some initial values for the fees, initial values for the mu's, initial values for the sigmas, all this. Theta zero will just be a list of all these values. And then we'll run the EM algorithm. You can see it stopped after 29, even though we had 30 iteration. Um, instead of going over each, let's just draw it. So here I have some helper functions that I used already in previous videos that will help me to plot the uh, results. And you can see pretty good results. So the points are the cluster means and the uh, circles are two times the standard uh, deviation. Okay, so it's like uh, an ellipse that covers two times of the standard deviation. Uh, and the EM algorithm, again, doesn't give you uh, the order 
So I could put colors, but I would have to do it manually. It only gives you a cluster and the sigma, so I just uh, did it in black. So you can see it works pretty good, uh, but this was kind of because I chose the right uh, seed. What will happen if I use different seed? Well, who knows? Let's check. Okay, so you see in red, in the colors show the actual clusters, and you can see that uh, the EM algorithm didn't really um, converge to the right solution. Okay, uh, it stopped before the maximum iteration, uh, but it gave us one cluster that covers both the green and the red, and two clusters for the blue. It kind of thought that the blue is two different clusters. Okay, so you see uh, the EM algorithm converges, but it's not necessarily converging to the true to the true parameters. Another thing you could do is maybe uh, as a homework assignment calculate. Uh, the confusion matrix. So we have three clusters, and in, remembering the final E gives the probability of being in each cluster, you can threshold that and get a decision, uh, which cluster do I belong to? You can take the maximum of uh, each probability and just assign that, that cluster to that X. And then you can check because you have the true data. You can check and see how much time was I right, how much time was I wrong, and see also um, how good uh, the EM algorithm works on, um, okay, how good it classifies the access to the right uh, cluster that it belongs to. So this is all for this video. Hope you enjoyed and see you in the next one.